All right, praise the Lord. Yeah, you just can't go past that high king. Sit, sit down if you can. You, can't, you just can't go past that high king forever. <laughs> that is just him. That is such a wonderful description. You know, the Lord, it blesses me so often. I, I love words, obviously. Uh, my craft is words, so to speak. And, and the way I communicate the gospel, obviously, is through words and, and images. And I just love that. And I, I respect people who write and create songs and music and words that are so descriptive and so captivating that they just capture concepts and, and understandings and just a, a, a work, I king forever. My king for oh, it's just it's just awesome, and we're here today. Easter is when we celebrate all the wonderful things that come true in our life because our Savior kept His word and did exactly what He said He was going to do. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to put this before you, and then uh, I'll answer this question at the end of of this this uh, first fateful day about the crucifixion of Christ. I just want to ask you, and don't jump the gun on thinking about it because it's not going to be obvious what I mean at first, so just kind of hang with me a second. Out of all the things, out of all the ways that Jesus could have died for us, why did he have to be crucified? Why, why couldn't it have been some other way? Why couldn't he die being hanged or even boiled in oil or drawn and, and drawn asunder or fed to the lions? Why was it the cross? Why did it have to be the cross? And why did it have to be so brutal? I've been studying now for the past couple of weeks and uh, you know how you guys know how I am when I get into something, and I've just it, as I every day it's just been one brutality after another in this crucifixion. I mean, it is just it's just barbaric, <laughs> for lack of a better word. It is just totally cruel and vicious, and I'm thinking, okay. I know Jesus came and died for our sin. And I know that there, a price had to be paid for God's judgment against sin. In order to be redeemed, redeemed means to be bought back. So in, in order for us to be bought back, for the title deed of the earth to be bought back, there had to be a price paid. And this price had to, had to be the, the punishment that we should have paid for the sin of our life, for the violation of God's trust, of God's word, of God's, of God's order, of God's law, of all that God gave us. So somebody had to pay for that. And it was Jesus, but what, why the cross? And why so brutal? Let's look at what, what God says. Five, three fatal days, faithful days of Christ. Of course, obviously, these are not unknown. The first faithful day, obviously, is the day of crucifixion. Let's talk about that day for just a moment. Shortly after sundown, and by the way, one thing you need to remember when you're talking about Easter and days and after sundown and before sunrise and so forth. You need to just put in your mind an awareness that in, in, that in the Jewish um, operation of a day, and it's still true today, they start their day at 6 p.m. We start our day at midnight, so it's not so unusual. You know, we start at midnight and end at midnight. They just start six hours before at sundown. This came from the book of Genesis where the evening and the morning was the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. So they start their day with the evening and, and it goes all the way around for a 24 hour period and the morning follows. So shortly after sundown, which means this is the start of a new day, 
shortly after sundown on Passover day, which is the first day of another feast called unleavened bread. It's the same feast, it's just, a, it's just the word for the first day of the feast and it celebrates the death angel passing over the children of Israel when they put the blood on the doorpost when God, was going, when God delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage. So it is the first celebration of the, of the feast day, the festival, the holy convocation season. There are three feasts in the spring, one about 50 days after the spring, which is Pentecost, and then three fall feasts. They all happen in the same month in the fall. This is the first feast of the year. And this is Passover, the first full moon of spring, 14th day of Nisan in the Jewish world. And shortly after sundown, Jesus gathers his disciples together and takes them into a room that has been prepared for them. And Jesus in that room eats the Passover meal with his disciples. Right in the middle of the meal, Jesus stops eating and he takes off his robe and he wraps himself with a towel and he gets down and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. And when he comes to Peter, Peter looks at him and says, Lord, I, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you're not going to heaven when you die. And Peter said, well, <laughs> in second thought, wash me all over, Lord. You know? And he explained to them what he was doing about humility and about serving and about how they must serve each other and they must serve the world and they can't be haughty and high-minded and proud. They have to be humble. And when he finished washing their feet, he got back up and they finished the meal and at the end of the meal, he took the, the bread and he, and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Now, I'm sure at that moment, they, they, they had no idea what was about to happen. Even though he told them, I'm going away. But I'm not going to leave you comfortless. You're not going to be orphans. I'm going to send uh, 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 someone just like me. Except he's going to live in you. He's not going to walk around with you. He's going to be, live inside of you. So don't be afraid, guys. You're not orphans. I'm not leaving you alone. But they didn't understand the depth of what was going to happen within the next 24 hours. And he, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. It's going to be broken for you. Here, you take this and eat of it. And as often as you do this, from now on, for the rest of time, I want you to remember me. And remember that I was bruised for your iniquities. I was chastised for your peace. And by my stripes, by the way, which are going to be many, many, you're healed. And then he took the cup. He held it up and he said, this, this is the New Testament in my blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So this is my blood, which is shed for you. Take and drink of it. And as often as you drink of it, you remember that my innocent blood was shed for your guilty soul. The blood of the innocent given for the, for the guilty. And when he finished speaking this to them, he began to tell them uh, information about what was going to happen and what, 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 what they needed to do. And it's all written in John 14, 15, 16. And then he prayed for them in chapter 17. The whole chapter is a high priestly prayer. He prays for them. He prays for the world. He prays for himself. It's just it's amazing if you've never read it. Go home this afternoon and read that. That's just, it's unbelievable. This is what Jesus did after he finished communion. Then, he, then about 10.30 that night, he takes Peter, James, and John, and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. 
And he says, guys, come and pray with me. And he, and, and he leaves them in one little place and he goes away and he prays and he comes back and they're asleep. He kind of jousts them up and he does the same thing. He comes back, they're asleep again. Does the same thing again and for the third time he comes back and he finds them asleep and he said, can't you even, and the old King James word is tarry, can't you even stay awake with me at this time for one hour? And then there was a clutter and a sound at the gate of the garden and torches lit. It's about midnight now. And down the lane comes Judas Iscariot and some members of the Sanhedrin and the temple guard and the Sanhedrin soldiers. They're coming down with torches blazing and Judas comes over and kisses Jesus, which shows you just how unremarkable Jesus was. How nothing about Jesus was majestic, nothing about him was unique, nothing about him separated him from all the other people there. Judas couldn't just point and say, that guy right down there and then describe some feature that made him unique. He had to go down there and actually kiss Jesus so they would make sure they got the right one. And Judas kissed him and the soldiers grabbed him and Peter cut off one of them's ear. <laughs> Peter, Peter, Jesus puts it back on. That would have ended my, uh, my time with him as a soldier right there. That would have been, okay, that's enough of that, you know. And they took him. And, the, and these, were, these were Sanhedrin soldiers. These were Jewish soldiers. Not Romans, Jews. And they started whipping on Jesus and beating on Jesus. They put, a, they put a purple robe on him. They blindfolded him, put a purple robe on him. Started hitting him with their fist. Saying, prophesy for us. Who hit you? Mocking him. Took him to Annas, who used to be the high priest. He was Caiaphas, the current high priest's father-in-law. Took him to him. He couldn't make any judgment. Sent him on to Caiaphas, who was the current high priest. Caiaphas, they hated Jesus. All of them hated Jesus. They wanted to kill him right there on the spot. But the Jews didn't have the power to pronounce capital punishment. Only the Romans could do that. So though they beat on him and though they mocked him and pulled his beard out and, 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 and just did him in terrible ways, they couldn't kill him, but they sure wanted to. And then they took him to the Sanhedrin, which are 23 members of a council, kind of like the Supreme Court for the Jews for the Jewish citizens. And because they all could do nothing but just hassle him and harass him and hurt him, they said, let's take him to the Romans. And so Jesus is taken first to Pilate, who is the governor of Judea, the whole region of Judea, Jerusalem, all that's Judea. Pilate says, what is this? And they say, this guy speaks blasphemy. Well, what does blasphemy mean to the Roman government? <laughs> There's no sentence for blasphemy against the, the, the Roman government. You're not blaspheming the Roman government. You're blaspheming the religion of the Jews. So Pilate says, I, I don't find any fault with this man. And then he hears in questioning Jesus that Jesus is from Galilee. Jesus is a Galilean. And Herod is the governor of Galilee. So Pilate says, let me just pass him off to Herod. This is a problem. And so Herod gets him and says, man, it's such a good, I've been waiting to get Jesus. I've been hearing he's doing all these miracles and boy, I just hadn't seen him and I'm just waiting. All right, Jesus, do me a miracle. Perform me a wonder. But here, Jesus doesn't even talk to him. And Herod gets a little frustrated and then he realizes, you know, this is going to be a real problem here for me politically. The Roman governor's going to hear about it. The Jews are going to be mad to go. Go back to Pilate. 
So he sends him back to Pilate. And one thing changed. They changed the charges. The first time they came to Pilate, they charged him with blasphemy. This time they charged him with insurrection. Because insurrection now was a sentence that the government could pass a sentence on. Devil still, he's still doing the same thing, isn't he? he do, he's never original. <laughs> he's just, he just does the same thing. Look, guys, we're living through this. We're living through it. What's going on right now? Same stuff. Everything's the same, just the names and the characters have changed. Same pattern, same everything. So Pilate says, ah, I'm washing my hands of this. And then he says, okay, I got an idea. I'm gonna get him off the hook. And he says, you know, in the Jewish custom on Passover day, it's customary that, that we release for you a prisoner. A prisoner gets grace today, gets released from prison. So, go to the prison, get me the biggest stinking bomb down there. Okay. So they bring back a murderer, traitor, insurrectionist for real. The worst, one of the worst criminals in that whole area. I'm sure everybody breathed a sigh of relief when Barabbas went to jail. And they brought Barabbas out there and, and Pilate said, who do you want me to release today, Barabbas or Jesus? And this knowing they were gonna say Jesus, <laughs> he did nothing but good. He did nothing but bless people. He healed people. He fed people. He taught people. People love Jesus. And this murderous pervert over here, this rascal, this traitor, and all the people said, give us Barabbas. Delusion. Delusion. Same thing today. Same, same thing. Delusion. And so he takes Jesus and he gives him to the Roman guards. And the Roman guards take him down into the praetorium, which is their dressing room, so to speak. And they start beating on Jesus. They hit him with sticks. They put a crown of thorn on his head. Start beating him on the head, driving those thorns down into his head. Start mocking him, spit on him. Slap him all in his face. Pluck, pluck, pluck whatever the Jews didn't get. Pluck his beard out. Mock him and ridicule him. And why is Jesus going through all of this? Why is, he, why is this happening to him? He's doing it for you and, and, and me. He's doing this because God loves us. And God loves us so much that he wants to be in our presence. That's why he created us. Do you know why God created us? Because he wanted to be in our presence. He wanted to have someone to fellowship with. Someone that would love him back and someone that would want to fellowship with him and that he could interact with and he could have relationship with and fellowship with and walk with and talk with and, 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 and we could be his friend. And we could have that kind of relationship. But when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, boom, God could no longer be in our presence. He wanted to be back. So here's Jesus suffering everything that he suffered so far. Well, that's not all. The scourging begins now. Do you know as far as I know, and I've done a lot of study. Now, you may be able to find it on Google or somebody may find it, Siri or one of those Alexas or whoever you talk to, Lucifer's or whatever they are. They may find something about this that I haven't been able to find, but I've been looking and I can't find anyone in recorded history that has ever been both scourged and crucified. Scourging was a, was a, was a capital punishment. 
Crucifixion was a capital punishment. You either got scourged or you got crucified. You didn't get scourged and then get crucified. Except Jesus. Only one ever to be both scourged and crucified. And the scourging begins. And I, I, I read an article, and I know some of you have probably seen it before. It was written in 1986. It was in the American Journal, the, the Journal of American of the American Medical Association. That JAMA that you see in doctor's offices, J-A-M-A, -A, the big, that's the Journal of American Medical Association. Not a Christian organization, right? They wrote an article in, in the March 1986 edition. You can look it up, it's online, it, it, it's, it's famous now. It's about 25 pages with diagrams, pictures, and everything. Where the American Medical Association described in medical terms, what, what happened to Jesus based on the Bible and, and a few other historical records of the day. What, what happened to him medically? What happened to him? Well, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, obviously. It's about 14, 15 pages. So I just kind of uh, condense it down a little bit. I wanna read you just a second uh, this. This is, this is the scourging. When the decision was made to scourge an individual. The victim was first stripped of all, clo all clothing so his entire flesh would be uncovered. The victim's hands were tied over his head to a scourging post. His wrists were securely shackled in metal rings to restrain his body from movement. When in this locked position, the victim could not avoid or dodge any of the lashes. Romans were professional at scourging and took special delight in the fact that they were the best at punishing their victims. Once a person was harnessed to the post, the Roman soldier began to put him through unimaginable torture. One writer of this day noted that the mere anticipation of the first blow caused the victim's body to grow rigid the muscles to knot in his stomach, the color to drain from his cheeks, and his lips to draw tightly against his teeth as he awaited the first sadistic blow. The scourge itself consisted of a short wooden handle with several 18 to 24 inch straps of leather attached. The ends of these pieces of leather were tipped with sharp, rugged pieces of metal, wire, glass, and jagged fragments of bone. This was considered one of the most feared and deadly weapons of the Roman world. The scourge was so horrific that the mere threat of scourging could calm an entire crowd or steal any courageous rebel's heart. Most often, two soldiers would carry out the punishment, simultaneously lashing the victim's body from both sides. Each time the torturer struck the victim, the straps of leather caused multiple lacerations. The pieces of metal, glass, wire, and bone sank into his flesh and then ripped across his body. The soldier would jerk on the scourge, pulling it hard to tear whole pieces of human flesh from the victim's back, legs, stomach, upper chest, and face. The victim would soon be so disfigured by the slashing blows of the scourge, historical records of the day described one victim's back as being so mutilated after a Roman scourging that his spine was actually exposed. So many blood vessels were sliced open by the scourge that the victim would begin to experience profuse loss of blood and bodily fluids. Because of the massive loss of bodily fluids, he would experience excruciating thirst, often fainting from the pain and eventually going into shock. Frequently, the victim's heartbeat would become so irregular that he would go into cardiac arrest. According to Jewish law, the Jews were permitted to give 40 lashes but because the 40th lash usually proved fatal, the number of lashes given was reduced to 39. 
And you may remember the Apostle Paul telling us this in 2 Corinthians. However, Jesus did not experience a Jewish scourging. This was a Roman scourging. The Romans had no such mercy law. Therefore, they could give a victim as many lashes as they wanted. The New Testament does not tell us what Jesus looked like after he was scourged. But Isaiah tells us that many were appalled when they saw Jesus. His face and his body were so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. From his appearance, you would scarcely know that he was a man. When the scourging was complete, Jesus was so severely depleted that he couldn't carry his own cross beam to Golgotha. Simon of Serene was compelled to carry it for him. When Jesus arrived at the cross post, his hands were nailed to the beam. They dragged the cross beam along with the sagging body of Jesus up the cross post and secured it in its place. His feet were driven directly into the wooden post so his entire weight rested on these three spikes. No seat like you've seen in pictures. No little stand down there to stand on. Spikes, spike, spike. A person hanging in this position must push himself up with his legs in order to exhale air out of his lungs. When they broke the legs, the victim would die within a few minutes with the arms so severely stretched on the beam. And any of you guys that have ever done chin-ups know this. Arms tight, much easier. Further away you get them, the harder it is. With his arms stretched like this, so severely stretched on the beam, there would not be enough strength to pull their weight up and to breathe. Jesus hung on the cross for six hours, from 9 a.m. in the morning until 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And each time he took a breath, he would have to raise his body up. Remember, his back had been scourged. Now his severely lacerated flesh with all the nerve endings exposed would have to would have been moving up and down for six hours on the rough wooden post and beam of the cross. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first thief on the cross and then the other. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. However, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water flowed out. The Journal of the American Medical Association believes this would cause a cardiac rupture, which would certainly have killed Jesus if he had not already given up himself to death. Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin that did not agree with the actions against Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for the body. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, another another believing Sanhedrin member, met Joseph and together they removed the earthly temple of Christ from the cross. Then quickly prepared it as thoroughly as possible in the short time they had between retrieving the body after 3 p.m. and before 6 p.m., which would start the next day. The next day was another Sabbath day. The next three days continued the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and no devout Jew could, contact, could have contact with leaven, especially the leaven of a dead body throughout the remainder of that holy convocation. This is the death of Jesus. Why did he have to die like that? 
the brutality, the hatred, the mutilation. Jesus died for our sin. He had the, the, the Old Testament, every, many times when it mentioned the cross, the prophet called it a tree. He must die on a tree, the tree of Calvary. The reason Jesus had to die on a tree is because he was paying for our sin. Adam and Eve took fruit off of a tree. It was a, it was a tree that was used to rebel against God. His hands had to be pierced. Why did they have to be pierced? Because it was with their hands that, that as tools Adam and Eve used to perpetrate the sin and rebellion of taking the fruit from the tree. He had to be pierced in his side by a spear into his heart. Why? Because when Adam and Eve sinned against God, it broke God's heart. A cardiac rupture is called by many doctors a broken heart. And he had to have a, a crown of thorns on his head because the earth was cursed. Thorns and thistles shall you bring forth. And it had to be, had to be driven into his head because the curse for man is by the sweat of your face you will earn your bread. Everything that happened to Jesus on the cross was a redemption of the sin of the fall. It was a price that had to be paid. And it all had to be paid. So let's stand to our feet now, and I want you to get your elements. Because now that you know what Jesus went through, now that you know what he did on the cross, when he took that bread at the Passover meal and he said, this is my body, If you need, a, if you need a, a, a bread, just lift your hand. Just will bring you one. You need, anybody needs a bread or, or, or a juice? All right. So after the supper, when Jesus took the bread and he said to his disciples, this is my body. Doesn't it look good? <laughs> it's going to be messed up. It's going to be broken. It's going to be striped. It's going to be beaten for you. It's going to, it's going to be chastised so that you can have peace. So take this and eat it. And as often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and he said, you know, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, my blood that is shed for you, the, sin, the, the, the blood of the innocent shed for the guilty. This was always true. This is what animal sacrifices were all about. An innocent, an innocent animal, perfect in every way. His blood was sacrificed to cover the sins of the guilty. Jesus is the Lamb of God and his sin covers our, his blood covers our sin. He washes us. Isaiah said, though you be red like crimson, you shall be as wool. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And Jesus said, as often as you drink of this, do it in remembrance of me. All right, you guys may be seated. So the first faithful day is over, the second faithful day, and it's not, I'm gonna make this one quickly for you, it's really, but, it need, but it's important. The second faithful day talks about his burial. 
why is it important that Jesus would be buried? I mean, he's already been crucified. His blood's already been shed. He's already suffered violence. What is the burial all about? Well, let me read you a passage out of Matthew 27. And this talks about the burial of Christ. On the next day, this is Matthew 27, verse 62. On the next day, now remember the next day is about five minutes away, all right? On the next day, because the next day starts at six o'clock. So they've put Jesus on the cross and it's almost sundown. I mean, they gotta get him on the cross before that day ends because the next day is a high holy day and they can't touch a dead body on a high holy day. So we gotta get him on the cross get him off the cross in the tomb. So on the next day, a few minutes later, basically, which followed the day of preparation, which is Passover day, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying, sir, we remember that while he was still alive, how this deceiver said, after three days, I'll rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people that he has risen from the dead, so the last description will be worse than the first, last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure. They put a giant boulder in front of it took many, many guards, many strong men to roll that giant stone that covered the entire opening of the tomb. Imagine this, how many people that took. So they rolled that giant stone there and, and, and sealing the stone, which means they took mortar, some type of mortar, and sealed around where the stone touched the, the rock of the tomb so that air and nothing could get in or out and setting a guard. So they rolled the stone, sealed it up from the outside and then they set the guard there. This was the burial of Jesus. Burial is important. There are two reasons why burial is important. One is burial displays finality. When someone passes and we bury them, that says they are not here. Their body is gone. The house that they lived in is closed. And though you might have thought there was a chance that they would be alive again or alive, this burial says that's not so. This is a finality. The second thing that it does, and this might sound funny, but in the scripture, burial is always associated with baptism. Now, let me just show you how this is important for us. Because as Christians, baptism is an important function of our relationship with Christ. Now, I do not believe that you must be baptized in order to be saved. I do not believe this. I think that if you can be baptized and you have the opportunity to be baptized, I don't know why you wouldn't be baptized if you believed in Christ. So though the thief on the cross never had a chance to be baptized, today you'll be with me in paradise, Jesus said to him. And there may have been a few others that may not have had an opportunity to be baptized after they received Christ because they faced death momentarily. Baptism is always related to burial. Let me read you in Romans 3 real quick. Uh, Romans 6. What Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do, you know, or do you not know that as many as of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so we also 
should walk in newness of life. Paul's just saying, when you get baptized, it's, it's, it's a symbol. It, it sh- it's a picture. And what it shows is you, like Jesus, were buried. You died to yourself. And then as Jesus was resurrected, when, when, we, when I bring you back up, you get resurrected to new life. This is the symbol, this is the symbol of dying to yourself. Burial of Jesus. I mean, they could have just thrown him on the city garbage dump. Why did they bury him? Because burial is an important issue, and it's an important issue in our life. And what it says to us is that uh, the word baptizo, word bab- baptize is the word baptizo, and it means to plunge or to immerse. And I'm not trying to get on some hobby horse up here, but I'm just saying that there are lots of churches, lots of denominations, and there are many groups of Christians that do not baptize by immersion. It, it loses all of its focus if you don't immerse them, Right? If you sprinkle water on their head or you take your hand and put it, this way a lot of Presbyterians do, put it in the water and then put their wet hand on the head, um, where's the death? I mean, if you get baptized by immersion and I hold you under that water, if I don't let you up, you're going to die. If you can't get up somehow, we both have a heart attack and you can't get up, you're going to die. It's it's. It's symbolic of death. And it means I have died to myself and I am identifying powerfully, publicly, and in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that cannot be denied that I am a Christian and Christ lives in my heart and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm a brand new person in Christ. So the burial of Jesus was the finality of the act because now they said he's gone. He's been sealed up. Everything's closed up. And he's gone. And, and, and we'll have to accept the fact. Now the third faith, faithful day is the day of resurrection. That's what today is. By the way, this is the day of first fruits. I don't know if you're aware of this. You might remember when I preached to you about uh, the four signposts. And then I preached another message about when will Jesus come? And I talked to you about these these Jewish feast days, these holy days that God gave the Jews. They're the only nation in the world that God gave them their holidays. And there are seven of them. First one's Passover. Unleavened bread starts basically the next day. Well, Passover is really part of unleavened bread, so it's all one big feast. It lasts for several days. So between the time Passover was back about three days ago and three nights ago, unleavened bread lasts all the way over to here. Today is first fruits. Jesus rose on first fruits, meaning that he is the first fruit of those that sleep. That's what Paul said in Corinthians. In other words, Jesus is the first one to be resurrected and to go to heaven. That's what it means. And because he's the first, it opens the door for everybody else to follow him. No one could do that until he went first and did it. And now everybody has a number. You know, you've heard the old phrase, your number's up. That's where that came from. You, you have a number somewhere down the line. Your number will be up and you will go. So today is first fruits. Now here's the way the scripture talks about what happened. An angel shows up sometime between last night at six o'clock and before the sun came up this morning. This day started at six o'clock last night. So anytime after six o'clock last night, you could have gone to the tomb and Jesus would not be there. The women just came early in the morning because it was, they could see. Remember, they couldn't flip a switch and they didn't have any flashlights and different things, elements like us. So sometime before sunup, an angel shows up and rolls away this huge stone in front of the door of the tomb. You know, angels are powerful. Let me me read you. I found this in Revelation 20. This is just a description. And and now this is just an angel. One angel, not even named. This angel's not even named. So it's not Michael and it's not Gabriel. 
It's just some angel, indiscriminate angel. Uh, it was almost like Michael said, uh, well, who's go, who are we going to send to do this? And Gabriel said, well, I don't know. Send a new kid. You know, I mean, he's not, even, he's not even called by name. That's how indescript he is. Let me show you what he did. Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He, this indiscriminate angel, <laughs> He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. And he set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more. That's one angel. Grab the devil. All of those people that talk about, I'm going to hell and party with the devil like he's some grand poopa. He can't even whip an angel, much less anything like that. I love the description Matthew says about this angel. Listen to, what, listen to the way Matthew says the angel was when they got to the tomb. Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, a bunch of Marys went to the tomb, and Salome, John's mama, Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord. Could have been the same one. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door. This part I like. And sat on it. Yeah. He rolls it back. And then if I had something up here to lean back on, I'd cross my legs and lean back and put cross my arm like it. And sat on it as if somehow he expected somebody to try to come and do something with that stone. He's sitting there like, all right, he's like Clint Eastwood angel, you know. So. Go, hey, punk, you feel, you feel lucky? Go ahead, make my day. <laughs> and he sits on the stone, <laughs> daring somebody to come. <laughs> come on, demon, I dare you. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The guard, he's, these are special forces Roman soldiers. These are, these are the Marines, the, uh, the, the Army, the Air Force. It, these are the special everybody's, the Green Berets. Uh, these are the Wolverine. These, are, er, these guys are the Praetorian Guards. And it scared them so bad, they just started shaking right in the middle of it. And then they... I think they just played possum, be, be honest with you. I, I think it said they fell like dead men. I think that was just like, boom, you know, because he was sitting there with his arm crossed going, what you going to do? And they just went like a possum. Have you ever seen a possum play dead? He just falls out. So that's what happened. That, that is an angel. So the one angel shows up. He moves the seal stone that the guards put in place. And Jesus comes and Jesus appears to Mary, his mother, and Mary, uh, the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome, the mother of John, who are coming uh, to anoint his body. Then Jesus says to, to Mary, go tell my disciples I'm coming to anoint them and I'll meet them in Jerusalem in the upper room. And so that's where we pick up right here, John 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, and that means shut up, it means like locked. So here are the disciples in the upper room with the doors locked. It says, for fear of the Jews. Now get the picture, the women are at the tomb, wide open, coming with spices for Jesus. The men are locked in a room, scared, of the Jews. I just want, I don't have anything else to say about that. I just wanted you to notice it. Where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst. And I did tell you the doors were locked, right? Here's Jesus coming into a locked room, standing in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. I, I, you know, I, I really, I think it is appropriate to say something if you walk through the wall. If you walk through the wall, I think you're going to pretty much have to say something to whoever's in there. 
uh, like peace, you know, hey, it's all right, be guys, settle down, you know. So Jesus is standing in the room. Now, the only reason I brought that up is because this tells me something. It tells me that Jesus has a resurrected body, not a resuscitated body. This is not a human body. Human bodies can't walk through walls, but resurrected bodies, and guess what? We're gonna have a resurrected body one day, and it's gonna be just like the body of Jesus. It's gonna be able to do everything Jesus could do. So here is Jesus walking through the walls to signify to them, hey guys, I know you saw me get put in that tomb. <laughs> I know you saw that I was dead and the finality of life was there, but here I'm gonna show you what's gonna happen after you die. You're gonna get a brand new body just like this and it doesn't matter what kind of tomb you may be in or how many guards they put in front of you. It is not final. It's resurrected, it's brand new. So here is Jesus, and Jesus is standing in front of them, and his resurrected body, and it demands now a verdict. All right. He was in the tomb, guarded by the guards, had the stone there. Now he's out. How did he get out? All right. He either had to be resurrected or... He just pulled off the greatest hoax that the world has ever seen. He somehow mutilated himself or made it appear as so. Uh, he died and nobody could find a pulse, a beat or anything. He, I mean, he couldn't even really find his arm probably. And then he goes in the tomb and he's got Roman guards there and he's got a big stone and a seal from the outside. And now he's out walking around, walking through walls. Oh, by the way, just so you'll know it, when I get my resurrected body, if you live in a mansion next to mine and I run out of bacon, I, I'm coming through the wall. <laughs> just, I just, just want you to know, all right? Uh, I don't care how you, if you lock the door or not. I, I'm coming through the wall and I'm, I'll be the one with a piece of bacon hanging off his nose in your refrigerator <laughs> rummaging around. It'll be a great day one day. I'm serious. The Lord promises us that. But here, here's Jesus. All right, so what happened? How, how did Jesus get out of this thing? Well, it's so important that you believe that he was resurrected that it is one of only two um, responsibilities, uh, acknowledgements, that's a better word, that it is only one of two acknowledgements that you must make in order to be saved. Romans chapter 10 Verse nine says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that means I surrender, you're my Lord. I give up. I'm not, I don't have a kingdom, you have a kingdom. I believe in your kingdom. I give myself up to you. I'm not fighting it anymore. You're Lord. I'm servant. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And here's the second Second acknowledgement, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Now, I want you to know that I've talked to people. I've, I've been in the ministry 47 years. I've been in many countries, much less this one, all over creation. And I've talked to all kind of people about receiving Christ. Do you know that you're gonna go to heaven when you die? Are you interested in what happens when you die? Everybody seemingly is to a certain extent and, and everything's fine. Do you believe it, it, that, that God sent his son Jesus to the earth? Yes, I believe that Jesus came to the earth. Do you believe that Jesus was God's son? Yes, he did all kind of miracles. Listen, there are historical books. Josephus wrote the history of the Jews. He's a Roman citizen. 
was not one of Jesus' followers, wrote, was commissioned by the Roman government to write the history of the Jews, and, and, and he wrote the history of the Jews, and he describes an, all through there about this Jesus of Nazareth who went around doing miracles and wonders, and he's, you know, he even makes a statement about him. He says he calls him a man, and then he, then he, says, then he backs up and says, if it's legal to call such a one a man. I mean, come on, there's lots of evidence. So people don't have trouble believing that. I don't believe that Jesus came, he was a son of God, all of that. You know where the problem comes? In believing that he died on a cross and was resurrected. That's what they stumble at. Well, let me, let me just tell you, I, I had one guy tell me, he said, I believe all that, uh, I believe all that, all that, but I, I, just, can't, I, I just can't believe that, G, that Jesus died and then rose from the dead. I said, well, then you can't be saved. Because if you don't believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, you ain't got nothing. That's right. Now, there have been a lot of books written by a lot of otherwise smart men trying to convince themselves that the resurrection didn't happen. Who have actually proven to themselves that it did, and they trusted Christ. C.S. Lewis is one that comes to mind. Josh McDowell is another one that comes to mind. Um, who else? Mar Frank Morrison, uh, uh, another one that comes to mind. So what are you going to do with the fact that Jesus is no longer in the tomb? And when they went back to look for him, he wasn't there. Where is he? Where did he go? Who got him? What happened? I mean, he has to, if he's not in the tomb and he didn't resurrect, uh, where is he? He's got to be somewhere, right? Well, let me, let me give you just, this, these are four little thoughts. These are some thoughts that people have had from that time until now about where Jesus' body is. All right, real quick. Number one, while the guards were asleep, the disciples came and stole the body. That's what some people think. Now remember, these are elite troops. These are the, you know, the SEALs and the, and the Green Berets and, the, and everybody. These are special forces. These, these, and these guys have been given such a, such a distinct mission to make sure nothing happens to the body of Jesus, which has been the biggest uh, talk of the country around there for, for, for years. So you've been given this massive assignment, very important assignment, and you're an elite troop, and you're going to go to sleep. You've got to stay up six hours, and you're going to go to sleep. And if they did, if the disciples came and stole it, who rolled the stone away for them? I mean, I know the disciples were in good shape. They were young, and they were in good shape for what they did, but they were fishermen and tax collectors and, you know, doctor what. I mean, they, there were no uh, bodybuilders, weightlifters, and special strong people in here. Who rolled the stone away for them? And, and then if these disciples came and stole the body, then they knew that they had stolen the body and that Jesus really didn't rise from the dead like he said. So why is it then that every disciple died a martyr's death? They were boiled in oil. They were fed to lions. They were crucified upside down. All for what? For proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you can be saved in his name. And I just submit to you that if you, look, there are plenty of people that die for a lie. But there are nobody I know that dies for a lie that they know is a lie. So you can't tell me, that, uh, why did the disciples die for Christ if they knew they came and stole the body? <laughs> Let me give you another one. Here's another one. This is brilliant. The authorities stole the body. That, that they knew those rascally disciples were going to come steal it. So they just beat them to the punch and they stole it before the disciples could come and steal it. And... Um, and the only question I have about that is, look, if you're the Roman government and you have the body, and these disciples are going around saying, he rose from the dead, just like he said, and you have the body, 
you, wouldn't you bring it out, drag it out in the middle of the street and say, throw it out and say, hey, there it is. If he's resurrected, what is that? And then you could have put down the insurrection right there on the spot. Doesn't make sense. Number three, the authorities and the disciples couldn't find the correct tomb. Oh my goodness. <laughs> They're looking in the wrong tomb. <laughs> Why don't you look at the ones with the guards out front? They can't find the right tomb. You mean 72 hours after they put him in the tomb, now they can't find the right tomb. With guards in front of it. Okay, that doesn't make a bit of sense. Here's the most elegant of all the theories. It's called the swoon theory. This is, this, is, this is really laughable, actually. All right, it says that Jesus did not really die on the cross. He simply fainted. <laughs> okay. When the guards came to break his legs, they just thought he was dead. He wasn't really dead. So they took his body down off the cross and they wrapped it in burial clothes. Now, this stuff about the shroud of Turan is a bunch of mumbo jumbo garbage. Jesus didn't wear a shroud. The scripture says they wrapped, the Jews wrapped bodies, like pieces of cloth, long, wrap, 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 like a mummy wrapped up. And then they put a towel on his face. He didn't have some robe with some face burnt. He had a towel on his face. He even left it folded up over there. The Bible tells you what he was buried in. Anyway, they, so these soldiers wrap his whole body up like a mummy while he's just fainted. All right, now it goes on. Gets, gets, <laughs> get, think with me now. And they took his body and they put it in a tomb and they rolled a big stone in front of it and sealed it with mortar. And then in the cool, damp tomb, Jesus revives. This is like World Wrestling Federation or something, I guess, you know. Hulk Hogan or, you know, what that macho man, whatever. I mean, you know how those guys get beat down and then all of a sudden they revive and they just become super powered? That's what happened to Jesus, according to this theory. And then he gets up. Now remember, he's all wrapped up. He gets up somehow on these feet that are mangled because a spike's been driven through them. And... And then he somehow unwraps himself from all of this wrapping. I mean, I don't know how. He maybe got a finger out. or I, I, I have no idea how, how that would happen. And then with that scourged, rip body, he rolls the stone away. Remember, that's been sealed from the outside. So he's got to unseal it. He's on the inside. He's got to unseal the outside. And then he's got to roll that big old stone away by himself with this body that is emaciated. No blood in it. No body fluids in it. Uh, been out for days. He's got to do that. And, and then he has to overpower these special forces. Now how he's going to do that without leaving any marks on them, I don't know. You know, how, how are you going to overpower them without, you know, I mean, you, you, if, you, if you were martial arts, you know, some of these heroes we have nowadays on TV, like Jack Reacher and people like that, I don't know, y'all know a bunch of them, but th those guys can beat up anybody. They could, like, 10 of them could be there and it wouldn't matter. They're going to get them all. But they have marks all over them. But the guards didn't have any marks. So how are you going to do that? And no sign of a scuffle or anything. And then just walk away and leave no evidence whatsoever that anything happened. There are no tracks. There's no scuffle place. There's no blood. There's no nothing. I submit to you that it takes more faith to believe that than it did to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. The, you know what Easter is? Easter is a fact that demands a verdict. And if, I mean, what, what do you think about Easter? I mean, is Easter real? I mean, it, it, I mean is Jesus real? Uh, is he, le as maybe, maybe this is an old saying, but is he legit? Well, if Jesus is legit, then that means everything Jesus said is legit, right? Like, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father in heaven draw him. 
You can't be saved anytime you want to be. Did you know this? You can't just drag up all of a sudden and say, I'm going to go up there and get saved. You have to be drawn by the Father. And if you don't, you'll never be saved. But anyway, I'll go on. That's too much preaching. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you might be also. So Jesus said he's gone to prepare and he's ready for us. And then he says that if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Evidence that demands a verdict, a living Savior, Lord's life. Would you, would you bow with me just one second?